Star Splitter. Hey guys, Danny Keen here. Thank you for checking out my Star Splitter podcast, a collection of science fiction short stories. Today's episode involves artificial intelligence and the human soul. Please check out the Star Splitter Patreon page to support us on our journey. Thank you. Unreal Earth, 3001 AD Flying cars streak above me, many hundreds of feet above. Rain patters on the parked hover cars that line the avenue as I pass. Above the buzzing skyway, a sleek, orange starship cuts through the murk and roars toward the west spaceport, and the puddles around me reflect the ship's motion in dim reflections. The small box presses against my skin under my coat. I touch the lump for a moment to make sure it's still there and continue. The restaurant comes into view with crystal windows, bright lights, hovering limousines, and richly dressed men and women hurrying out of the rain. The men I pass, suits and all, seem soft and simpering like sleazy snakes. No, not snakes. Glossy plastic mannequins with surgery-induced perfection. And I wonder if I look the same to them. I've never had cosmetic surgery, unlike 80% of the population who poured billions into the beautification industry. That aside, I do look the part. At least I think I do with this suit that feels tight around the shoulders and arms. It hugs my legs and backside a little too tight. The tailor had said that fitted suits were designed to show off muscle, which I had, but this was a little bit ridiculous, considering I'm used to leather jackets, ordinary pants, and boots. But sacrifices should be made today. Today is special. She's special. My mouth feels dry, and I shift my grip on my umbrella. Scratch my goatee. In a few moments, I reach the restaurant's entrance and go inside. A robotic waiter with thin metallic arms and a giant bobble head takes my jacket and umbrella while another leads me to the reserved table on the inside balcony. The balcony sits in the very back of the building. Two other tables occupy the veranda, overlooking the rest of the dining room, both empty, just as I'd requested. Massive crystal chandeliers twinkle at intervals along the mosaic ceiling. The black carpet and tablecloths contrast with the white suits and gowns of the men and women. Black and white night, they'd called it, when I'd reserved our table. Weird artsy snobs. Carefully, I sit down, unsure if I'll rip my pants by sitting too quickly. The waiter flourishes in and places two crystal goblets on the table and fills them with rosé. Soon I'm alone again. My palms sweat and I wipe them on my pants. I feel as nervous as I did on prom night. I scratch my head and smirk. Who would have guessed that I'd be here instead of buried on some godforsaken planet light years away? The rosé tastes smooth and wets my mouth. The alcohol soothes my preteen nerves and I take a breath. A soft rustle makes me glance up. A tall goddess, with pale skin, dark hair, and blue eyes, floats in the room in a luxurious white gown that swishes with each step. Tamara. My heart smiles before my lips do. I stand and hurry to the other seat and pull it out for her. Her eyes sparkle, and she sits with a grace that I can't understand. How was the traffic, I say. Busy as always, you? We talked about the weather, and the new additions to the spaceport. We talk about tomorrow's father, Silas Wayne. I met Silas six months prior, after a man named Cornyn kidnapped Tamara. At first, he'd wanted only a ransom, but once he understood who she was and what secrets she held, he'd taken her far away on the other side of the galaxy. As a retired soldier and a friend of the family, I was hired by Silas to track his daughter down and save her. In the end, I got her back. It took months, but here we are. A blur of movement over Tamara's shoulder reminds me that her security guards are not far away. They probably plastered themselves all over the building, monitoring her and the area with their cliché sour glower 
but the guards keep their distance, and I'm thankful for that. We sip wine. We eat fancy food I usually avoid. We laugh at our travels. Robotic waiters come and go, and the murmur of the rich and famous echo around us. Tamara puts her half-empty wine glass down. I'm enjoying this. Thank you for inviting me. She wipes her mouth with a napkin and clears her throat. But I need to know, what are you doing? The question is so blunt for her that I'm at a loss for words. Her blue eyes kiss mine, and she smiles, searching my face. Her red lips seem to gleam in the warm light. She waits until she seems sure that I'm not going to answer. Going to the coffee shop around the corner would have sufficed. So again I ask, What are you doing? A line creases her forehead, and she bites her lip. I... I don't. I pause and gather my thoughts. I brought you here to tell you something. I wanted to thank you. I need my palm with my other hand. For everything. You saved me. I should be thanking you. It's more than that. I don't think you understand how close I was to giving up. After the front lines, the nightmares are getting worse. Much worse. Tears prickle the back of my eyes, and I blink them back. I cough and continue. The mission to save you was my last attempt at saving myself before... I hesitate again. I gave up. I don't know if I would have been selfish enough to end it or just implode and never leave my room. Tamara's warm hand reaches across the table and grips mine. She sighs. I'm sorry. Don't be. You helped me have enough courage to get help, so thank you. I'm okay now because of you. She smiles and squeezes my hand again. Looking at her, you never guess what she... No. I stop myself and shake my head. With my free hand, I reach into my pocket. And with a shaky breath, I begin. I also brought you here because I have something to ask you. I pull out the small box and hand it to Tamara. We've gone through so much together. And we understand each other more than anyone has a right to. She opens the box with slender fingers. The ring sparkles and laughs in the light. I know I'm a bumbling fool. And I trip over my words as much as my feet. Marry me, Tamara, I say. A nervous laugh escapes my lips. Her gaze meets mine again, and her lips quiver. Her eyes glow and her features lift. A mini-sun explodes inside my chest when I realize she's going to say yes. She's going to... The box snap closed. She stands and walks away. My heart rams against my chest, and I struggle to breathe for a moment. Stunned, I stand and follow Tamara. She walks to the edge of the balcony and looks down at the hundreds of people and robotic waiters. I lean on the guardrail and stand beside her without saying anything. I know her well enough to let her speak when she's ready. Moments pass. This is exactly why I didn't want to come tonight, she says. But father insisted that I owed you some dinner and a little conversation, especially after- Tamara whirled around and began to march toward the stairs. I'm sorry, Will. Wait! I instinctively grasped her hand, stopping her in her tracks. I... I... I struggle to form the words. You don't love me, she says in a flat tone. That's not true. I shouldn't have come. She pulls away and turns to the stairs. I didn't mean to play with your emotions. Then why did you come? My voice fills with bitterness. More than I intend. Because I care about you. Tamara snaps and jerks around. Maybe it was the wrong decision. A part of me wants to say yes, but... Then say yes, I say. I can't, Tamara whispers. She whirls from the edge and swishes past our table, and I follow her. On the back of the balcony, glass doors lead onto another terrace in the rain. Drops of water hiss and sigh on concrete and guardrails alike. Tamara stands under the eave and watches the elements play. For a few minutes, we watch the rain. 
She sighs and turns to me and holds out the small box. Please take it back. I shake my head, and the ache in my throat makes it hard to speak. It was a gift. I can't marry you. Why not? You know why. No, I don't. Yes, you do. There's no reason we can't be together. I snap. Anger, frustration, and hurt cut through my voice. Stop! Tamara shouts. Her eyes blaze and tears cut along her cheekbones. I'm not real! Is that not reason enough? I grip her hand. Her eyes grow wide, and she tries to pull away, then stops. Her fingers feel warm, smooth, very real. The contact makes me come alive. I lean in and wait. Inches from her face, our lips barely apart. I can touch you. I can feel you. I see you. And, I whisper, I can taste your kiss. Isn't that real enough? Our lips brush. Tamara pulls away. But it's an illusion. It's a shadow of what could be. She begins to pace, balling her hands into fists. I'd be cheating you of something more, something real. I'm choosing you. You're not forcing this on me. You're not cheating anyone. But I am. If I said I loved you and let you in, then I've never actually loved you. Tamara turns away from me. Please. For a heartbeat, Tamara says nothing. She stares at my shoes. No, she says in a low tone. I shake my head. But you're not. I'm an android, William, she shouts. Her words cut deep. I tried to distance myself from her on her way back to Earth. But she'd been so kind. So selfless. Do you remember the mandate father programmed? Yes, but tell it to me, Tamara whispers. Rule one. Never harm a human being. Rule two. Never harm- Not the three laws of robotics, Tamara snaps. Tell me the mandate that father gave me. I hesitate, but the fire in Tamara's eyes burns my soul, and I obey. He programmed you to seek the good of those around you. Tamara nods. You've known all along. I'm a significant investment for my father. That's the real reason why he paid you to come and recover me. He doesn't love me, and I can only give the appearance of love and emotions as a whole. I am the cutting edge in artificial intelligence technology. But I don't care. She points at me. You should care! Her eyes are emotionless for a moment, but then a single tear slips free and her hands tremble. You, you humans are so fickle. Most of the time you need and want real things. You long for real adventures, real exercise, the real outdoors, a real god, and real relationships. But you are too cowardly to face the risks that realness presents. So you make virtual reality, entertainment, sex dolls, and me. Sob after sob hits her, and she crumbles to the ground. I hurry and sit beside her. She cries on my shoulder for a while. A deep ache spreads across my soul, and I'm not sure what to do. It hurts to see her like this. My eyes burn, and I take a shaky breath. Despite my better judgment, a tear slips free. Father created me to replace the loss of his real daughter, Tamara sniffs. You... You were lonely, afraid to reach out to real people, so when you found me, you latched onto the surrogate realness you saw. I fell in love with a girl, I say in a hoarse voice. A real girl. You. You fell in love with a reflection. A shadow, she says. Father put a myriad of personalities into his computer and then shuffled them. He let the computer pick one to download into an artificial body so that he would discover who I was. Tamara struggles to her feet. I help her, and she begins to walk in the rain. My clothes cling to me, but I ignore the discomfort. Let's go inside. We can talk there, I say. She ignores me, 
and keeps walking across the balcony. She reaches the end of the terrace and looks at the expansive cityscape with flashing lights, reflections, and motion. Tamara pauses for a moment, but keeps her back turned. It's funny. The emotions that I seem to have are just imitations of the real thing. I don't feel actual loss. I don't love the way you do. She combs her wet hair behind her ears. I stand watching her, shaking. I'm not sure if I'm cold or trembling. I don't have a soul, William. That's the only real difference between me and any other person. A soul is such a strange thing. Everything is deeper, more profound, more real. With my heightened senses, I can sense the emotions coursing through you. The profound lostness, the confusion, the grief. I sense the joy and the excitement and yes, even the love. Tamara turns and looks at me. And for a few minutes we stand there, motionless in the torrent. Her eyes begin to move back and forth, as if she were assessing me. Thinking. Planning. Finally, she breaks. I found the real girl. I frown. What? I found the girl that my personality is from. Her name was buried in the data stream. Father made it hard to find, but I'm not dumb. Tamara's white dress clings to her, and her black hair begins to slip from its place. Her name is Tamara Swift. She's attending the Intelligent Design College. She let Father scan her brain like many young people did to make a little extra cash. Tamara hugs herself and takes another deep breath. Her eyes search my face. She's the real thing. But she talks like me, thinks like me. And if I can say anything about her, you're her type. A laugh that turns into another sob escapes her. I step toward her and pause a foot away. You're my type, I say, and cross the chasm between us. Our lips meet. This time Tamara doesn't pull away, and the world fades from my mind. But Tamara's lips leave mine. For a moment she looks past me, her eyes searching the air again, assessing, thinking, calculating. Then she nods and swallows. My mandate is to seek the good of those around me. Her jaw clenches. She leans into my ear and whispers, Find her. Stop running. Stop loving shadows, William. Find the real girl, and you'll find real love in return. Tamara steps back and smiles. It's that smile, that same brilliant, happy smile that made me know everything was going to be okay so many months ago. She closes her eyes. Initiating complete memory wipe. My stomach drops. No! Time slows for me. Each drop of rain takes seconds. Minutes. Hours to pound the building in the spray. I step toward her. I hear her father's voice in my head. It was before I went to find Tamara. I'd been walking with Silas in the expansive and exotic garden he kept around his mansion. We'd paced for hours, discussing the best way to retrieve her. And he'd helped me try to understand how she thought. She's programmed to seek the good of those around her. She calculates, uses mathematical algorithms, and complex emotional data to find ways to make life better. It's how I made her. As much as I'd like to believe otherwise, she's only the sum of my programming. Tamara's eyes roll up inside her head, and she collapses, falling backwards off the balcony. Tamara! Time slows for me. She falls, down, 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 alongside the drops of rain. Tamara slaps against the asphalt below, and white android blood spatters on the street, cars and well-dressed people. Their screams echo. The scene tears my heart open, and I gasp. 
My world narrows until all I see is Tamara's lifeless face. Blue electric lights wink behind her eyes and go out. I'm shaking, convulsing. My heart rams against my ribcage. To seek the good of those around her? How is this good? Then it hits me. I would have never let her go. The realization shoots through my brain like acid. And Tamara knew it. She'd taken herself out of the equation permanently so that I'd be forced to move on. But this selfless act shows her humanity, doesn't it? Doesn't it prove that she truly loved me? Or was she just living out her programming? The only answer I can give is I don't know. And I love and hate her for it. Stop loving shadows, William, Tamara had whispered in my ear, her tone tender, soft, knowing. Find the real girl. Thanks for listening to this episode of Star Splitter. See you next time.